welcome to High Flyers. And in this programme, they don't come much more high flying than the CEO of the Scottish SPCA, Kirstine Campbell. Now, I have to declare an interest here because as a television director, I've made almost 90 programmes following the work of the Scottish SPCA for STV and Sky. And Kirstine's been hugely supportive of those shows. But five months since we locked down, I'm wondering how the society is managing. And Kirsty, the big headline from your website is that you fear coronavirus could lead to a 20% drop in your income. So we are entirely funded by generosity. So £16 million of generosity every year to fund us, which is £44,000 per day. When you look at our income sources, um, we receive, we're very fortunate to receive a lot from legacies and from people who are regular givers, our members we call them, so people who donate every single month. That is the bulk of our money. We also raise money from things like community events, um, from corporate fundraising, and obviously in looking at this at the start of the pandemic, we thought, well, there are going to be absolute holes in our you know, expected fundraising income. So things like community and events, well, we can't really go out and do that, much as our supporters want to support us. <laughs> You know, things like London Marathon and others were all cancelled. Get-togethers we'd planned were all cancelled. Fundraising, you can't go out in the street and kind-hearted people giving you money. That's all gone. Um, corporate uh, businesses obviously have their own challenges during a time like this. We certainly couldn't expect that type of level of support. Uh, and also with our members, things like redundancies, everyone has their own you know, situation to consider. So we completely understand why some people couldn't support us. So we have looked at it closely and our mid-year results um, are not as bad as the 20%, but we are still obviously down on income. And we're also thinking this really is, we're, we're all appreciating this isn't a short-term issue, this pandemic. And really it's the medium to long term that we're all very concerned about because for us as a society, we have worked throughout, we've been incredibly busy throughout and we expect to get even more busy in the future as more and more animal welfare issues may emerge out of this. So for me, it's thinking about the long term financial sustainability. Yeah, so there's two big issues that come out of that, I guess. One is the financial side of things. You know, how yes. are you coping with, a, a, you know, albeit not 20% uh, decrease yes. in your income? But second of all, um, the, the protocols that you will have had to change just to get your teams out there, the, the animal rescue yeah. officers out there and the inspectors out there. What, how has yes. that affected them? Yeah, well, interestingly, I'm going around doing socially distant <laughs> engagement sessions just now in our rescue centres, in the dog runs, etc., just to check in on that. So our, at the very start of this, health, safety and well-being of our team is number one because we can't help any animals unless we're looking after one another. And then the ability to deliver our services because we deliver vital services to animals and people. People don't always see the people aspect to this in every single community in Scotland. Um, and the third aspect you've talked about is financial sustainability. How do we do all of that, keep that going and change our fundraising model and save as much money as we can all at the same time? So I think we've done a phenomenal job. I'm completely biased, but we have not missed a day. Our helpline used to be based in Dunfermline. They seamlessly all moved to working from home. The first six months of this year, they've handled 120,000 calls, support, advice. That's only, it would normally be about 130,000. So it's not that much reduced. We've been giving advice to people who've been worried about COVID and animals impact. If you think back to the very start of this, there was a whole, oh, can you get it from animals? Can I take my dog out? There's a whole lot of different issues with people phoning who have COVID, um, sadly, and very sadly, some people who've passed away. And it's the help that we are then able to give. Um, our rescue officers and our inspectors have been out to 36,000 incidents. Normally in the first six months a year, that'd be about 39,000 incidents. So that's still a lot. We noticed maybe in March, April, our jobs went down, but then as the months passed, they have really gone up. There are a lot of people out there needing help, whether that's, as you know, rescuing wildlife. This is the busy time of the year. All the babies are being born, all the orphan animals. We have been inundated with calls around that. 
but also welfare concerns because we do enforce the Animal Health and Welfare Act on behalf of the Scottish Government. So we have that role. So we have been going out to different investigations, things like the puppy trade. Um, right now, puppies are in high demand, prices are inflated, and that leaves a massive space for the, the low welfare. So we have been incredibly busy. The front line have just been phenomenal. Have all been working to new protocols with health and safety. <laughs> it must have felt like there's a new protocol every week. Um, we have nine rescue and rehoming centres. They all continued. We had to get animals out into homes because we couldn't have the public coming to our centres for a few months. We set up a fostering programme. 260 kind families took on animals for us throughout the beginning of the pandemic. We changed how we rehome when we were allowed to do that, virtual rehoming, homing by appointment. I mean, the team have been unbelievable. They've responded to all this change. And we have um, had about 4,000 animals arrive in the first six months of the year. Normally that'd be about 4,500, so not a massive difference. And we've managed to rehome around 1,700 animals, which, you know, a few hundred fewer than usual, because obviously we couldn't do it for a period of time. So we have just continued. There seems to be a, a trend at the moment, because we're maybe in lockdown or have been in lockdown, that people are, are yeah. getting puppies, they're, they're getting pets. Are you concerned that there might be, you know, we might be storing up problems for the future? Yes, in a word, yes. I think there has been a lot of the lockdown puppy. I mean, you'll have seen it everywhere. Um, everyone is reporting it. Vets are reporting the fact that they're seeing lots of puppies and also thinking there's quite a lot of puppy trade. Um, animals with behavioural issues, animals who are ill. The, the demand for puppies cannot be met by the supply from assured and reputable breeders and rescue centres. And that leaves an opportunity for people who care nothing about animal welfare. Um, a lot of the puppy trade is serious and organised crime. It's people who've gone from guns and drugs to dogs because the penalties are not there. Now that in Scotland, thankfully, is changing later this year. And that's a change that received royal assent throughout the lockdown period, which is fantastic because- Is this the 12 months to five years? Possibly? That's right. So right now today, um, if you were found guilty of the worst kind of animal welfare crime, the maximum a sheriff could give you would be 12 months and the maximum fine would be £20,000. Hopefully later this year, we're not sure when it'll exactly come in, but it's all been approved, it will be five years and an unlimited fine. But the massive, massive change in the legislation that the Scottish SPCA drove was the fact that today, if we go out and seize multiple animals, I've been on a puppy farm where we seized 100 animals, it was horrific, I will never forget it seize all these animals, but we then had to keep them because if they're not signed over to us by the perpetrator, then we don't own them to rehome them. So we keep them for the duration of the court case. And as you know, that can take years. So a temporary refuge animal on average would be in our care for 203 days. That is not good animal welfare. And financially, that's a bit of a disaster for us. But first and foremost, it's not good animal welfare. Puppies can be born in our care and that leaves lo lots of other kind of issues around that. So now with the change in law, we're going to be able to rehome after three weeks without a court order. Wow. I know. It is unbelievable. So 21 days rather than an average of 203 days, which is so good for animal welfare. It had um, unanimous support across the Scottish Parliament. So Scotland is going to be ahead of the game in animal welfare legislation and we're absolutely delighted it means we can help more animals but it also means that the the penalties are harsher and they more befit the crime there's so much money to be made in this if you look at any prices right now if you go online and you're looking for a puppy the chances are it's going to be puppy trade it's going to be low welfare breeders and dealers who care nothing and the scammers the people who have bought puppies and actually no puppy exists um, people are the public are making mistakes because they don't appreciate the lengths these other people will go to. One other thing that occurs to me um, as perhaps a res result of this uh, this pandemic is you you did an enormous amount of work in schools. Well, obviously that yes. will have stopped up until I, I guess a couple of weeks ago, or has it? Yeah. 
Uh, well, we're, we ha we we didn't ever stop. We just changed. That is another reason we're so proud of how we've responded to the pandemic. At the very start of this, it was around how do we continue to deliver our services. So prevention's in our name, and we're often associated with the cruelty aspect. And oh, they just go in and you know remove the animals and um, take people to court. But say last year, our inspectors would have responded to about 80,000 incidents and that would lead to about 80 court cases. So there are so many more people we help. Prevention is in large part about education and inspiration, which is why we've really been expanding our education programme, which is why we did not want to stop that during the pandemic. We just had to think how we did it. So we'd probably seen about 50,000 young people by the time lockdown started. That would be the normal because we go into schools, as you know, and it's a free um, education program that we offer. So we changed that to online and we've had over 6,000 downloads of our online materials for preschool, primary school, secondary school. There's, there are different aspects and different ways that we would want to communicate with young people that's appropriate. And we also recognise that not every young person has access to online or the internet. So we prepared um, hard copy packs and we worked with Barnardo Scotland and Pilton Youth Project and, and other areas to get these packs to people who need them most. And Police Scotland were brilliant. They actually, because it, it was harder for us to move, although we've got an essential purpose, it was easier for Police Scotland to help us with that. So they came, took the packs and distributed them for us. So it was a real, the partnership working during this has been fantastic. It really, really has, because nobody could do it alone, including working with other animal welfare charities, children's charities, as I've mentioned. So we have not reached as many people, of course we haven't, but we have still been able to do that. And what we are gonna do now is we're talking with schools um, and other groups say, how could we still reach you? And it'll be a more blended service that we'll offer now, some face-to-face -face where we can, and it's appropriate, and an awful lot maybe through online means. It's so important to keep that education side of it going, because that is what's gonna help us make the future better for animals and people. And part of that education process, Kirstine, just just tell people, uh, I'm sure involves or revolves a, a lot around what you call first strike and this animal guardians program that you have. Yes. Just a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, some people might not be aware. It's interesting when I talk about it with safe friends. I've been doing this. I've been lucky to have the show for about three years. Um, and when I talk to people about my job, everyone's so fascinated about things like the puppy trade, but then also talking about the direct link between violence against humans and violence against animals. Very often um, when there's an animal and behind an animal in need, there's a human and vice versa. And you mentioned their first strike, we relaunched a campaign during lockdown called First Strike, because very often the first strike is against an animal. And somebody who has harmed an animal, research shows us, is five times more likely to harm a human. So we have a role to play in that. We work really closely with partners in Women's Aid and Police Scotland and, and others um, to try and raise awareness of this. Because very often, if there is violence in a home, the family member does not want to remove themselves from that situation for fear that their animal will be harmed. And I've seen horrifying things that have happened when you know one partner has done something terrible to a much beloved animal to get back at the other partner so what we will do and what other partners like dogs trust will do will be to help and and help we will take responsible responsibility for that animal dogs trust of a freedom project they do that very well where they'll take responsibility for the animal and that allows the person to flee the home and when they're back in the feet we can return the animal to them Let's turn to a happier subject, hopefully. Um, I, I'm sure there must be, in amongst it all, there must be some success stories that you've had over the last few months, something that have made oh, yes. society really proud of what, what you guys do yes. on the front line. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know sometimes it does sound a bit doom and gloom, but, but I, as I was, I was talking to some of the guys today saying, you know, they have to remember that when we take in an animal from a horrendous situation, it is in the best place, the best possible place and we can turn it around and you go out and you see uh, you know animals have just arrived and it is heartbreaking but 
the love, the rehabilitation, it doesn't matter how long it takes. We never put a healthy animal to sleep ever. We will keep them for months, years to look after them, to get them back on their feet, to get them out into a good home. So there's been amazing stories. So, you know, we have had Troy, who was one of the dogs that we've had in Valerno for two years, finally found his forever home. And one of our behavioural experts is working with the family who have adopted him to help him stay in the home because you'll understand some animals, do, especially if you're in a rescue centre for a long period of time. We have fantastic staff, we have sensory gardens that some of our corporate partners very kindly have funded for us, but it's still not, it's, it's not a place for an animal to grow up. So that was fantastic to see him to go out to his home. We've had things like uh, Shetland ponies born on site with us up in Aberdeen, which is just lovely. And they have gone off to good homes. We'd one called Maui, who went off to a family who already had a horse called Tango. So they've renamed Maui to Cash. So they've got Tango and Cash now. So that's great. <laughs> and then there is one case, uh, one story that you might have seen. Rocky was a dog who was abandoned. He was left tied up to a park bench in Lanarkshire. Um, in a you know very anxious state, took him in, rehabilitated him, got his back on his feet, and he went off to a lovely home. And you should see the teams that I work with when the animals that they have cared for and loved go out. It's the biggest celebration. I mean, obviously they're always sad to see them go, but they're so so happy. Uh, and one of our one of the stories that got it is really interesting. So um, in the same week that we put out research that shows that one in four people in Scotland think we are the RSPCA. We're not, we're completely separate. They're fabulous and we work alongside them, but they're in England and Wales and we're in Scotland, two completely separate charities. The story that got by far greater pickup was a fox cub rescue from one of our brilliant uh, animal rescue officers, Jan, that you will know. And um, she was aided in this by, you won't believe it, PC Fox of <laughs> Scotland. So PC Fox <laughs> res helped to rescue a fox cub and that went absolutely everywhere but it was so lovely because I see PC fox holding this wee fox and that fox was then taken to our wildlife centre um, to be looked after and cured for until old enough to be released back into the wild so there are oh yeah for, for every for every terrible terrible story there are thousands of amazing stories of the work that the team do and it is really inspirational they are truly an inspiration. They're the most amazing bunch of people that throughout this have just kept on going. Animals have still been in need. People have been in need and in fact, maybe even more in need than ever. And so they were just all still desperate to be there and desperate to help and yeah, work in very, very different ways because their well-being does come first. But the fact that we've been able to do that and try to save as much money as we can and trying to earn money in different ways. But a big part of it's been trying to raise our profile to say, look, here we are, this is what we do, this is the difference we're making in every single community. And we're helping animals, but we help people. There's a person behind the animal, and you know, we're helping all of those people in every single community, islands to the borders. So we play a vital role in society and we've just we've just kept going, kept doing it. Well, on that note, and it's a very positive one, Kirstine Campbell, thank you so much for joining it's me. It's really kind of you to give us the opportunity. We're delighted.